Well, aloha, everyone. Um, another Wednesday. I can't believe it's already Wednesday. Where did Monday and Tuesday go? This is Mitch Yuan. I'm your host today for uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And I'm very fortunate to have uh, Richard Ha as my guest uh, today. Richard is actually over on the uh, Big Island and uh, in Hamakua. And through the magic of technology, uh, almost the magic of technology, we couldn't quite get him on the video. But we do have him on the phone. So we'll be uh, crossing uh, the water over to the Big Island to talk to Richard. So I've known Richard for a long time. He's a good friend. And he's a good friend of, for, for Hawaii. Uh, Richard um, is a big fan of hydrogen. So we'll get to that eventually, so, uh, which is great. So without more ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Richard Ha. Richard, aloha. <laughs> How's it? Aloha. That's ah, good. So there you go. There's you see a picture of uh, Richard uh, on the screens with uh, doing the shaka. So Richard, uh, let's uh, just tell me a little bit about your background. Like you're uh, you're a farmer, and uh, yeah. so tell me a little bit about your background and and your business. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my family is a Kamohili family from Lower Puna, uh, and uh, I've been farming for forty years. Uh, commercial farming, bananas at first, and then we went on to hydroponic uh, uh, tomatoes. Right. So how big was your farm, Richard? It was like a pretty big farm, and you employed a lot of people. So how, how big an operation was it? Well, at one point, we were farming 600 acres of bananas. We produced about 6 million pounds annually. Right. And, uh, and the hydroponic tomato operation, we were doing about uh, a million pounds annually. So it, it was a, a fairly large operation. Right. I remember uh, buying your products uh, at Costco. I think uh, Costco was one of your vendors, correct? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, now we have to buy uh, our tomatoes too. <laughs> so, Richard, why did you get out of farming? There must be a story here. Well, you know, we're all about uh, keeping track of the numbers. Yeah, we, our, our idea is that the pluses have to exceed the minuses, um, and and it's it's all math. It's not very uh, confusing as far as that. It's just math. Um, but one thing that was possibly unusual is that from the early days we would do a, a weekly break-even analysis. Yep. So we, we always knew exactly where we were. And the reason we did the break-even analysis, besides keeping track of what's in place today, was we were always looking into the future, maybe 10 years out, and trying to figure out what, where we wanted to be. And then with the break-even analysis, we forced the changes necessary to get where we needed to be. So we, we didn't just look at the numbers and make a decision based on the profitability. What we did was we tried to determine where we want it to be, and then we forced a change to get us there uh, within the parameters of the numbers, yeah. So what kind of changes would you make? Give, give us a, an example. Well, you know, so we were farming uh, in uh, Kapuho, and then we, we started to realize that um, we were far away from the, we had to travel a lot, and uh, uh, the ground there was mostly uh, uh, cinder from the Kapoho eruption, and uh, it wasn't the most, the best situation. So we we figured out that we needed to move. So what we did was we we set up uh, uh, on uh, Keao when the Puna sugar uh, plantation closed, and we essentially forced our Kapoho business out of business. Because you know we could tell it, it would have been more uh, profitable to to set up in uh, uh, in, in KL after a certain volume, so we did that. Excellent. So, um, how about uh, talking before we get into some of your other notes that you passed on? Let's talk a little bit about the nexus between or the uh, connection between energy and farming, and your ability to make the pluses equal more than the minuses, because this is an energy show, and I think it's important for our viewership and people out there in Hawaii to know how important energy is to 
farmers and agriculture here in Hawaii because I don't think people realize that. Like you, you moved your business just to get a little bit closer, you know, in addition to getting better land or more fertile land, it was you're still traveling a lot, using a lot of energy. So tell us about how important energy is to farming. Yeah, well, you know, back in 2007, we, we noticed that our cost of operating started to go up and it was more, mostly related to our supplies. You know, the plastics, the, 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 the chemicals, the boxes and stuff like this. It took us a while to realize that these were all related to byproducts of uh, uh, fossil fuels. Right. And but once we realized that, then we figured, okay, I need to go for, learn about this stuff. And, and I heard about this uh, association for the study of peak oil. They were having uh, annual conferences at that time. So I went to the first conference. And, and, and it was pretty uh, eye-opening because the first thing I picked up out of that, and, and keep in mind that I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm a farmer. So I'm looking over there, trying to figure out who's saying what, um, who, who is believable, who's just blowing smoke and that kind of stuff, just trying to figure it out. But the first thing I, I picked up was that the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding for the last 20 years. And they showed it on a graph, and I, I told myself, well, holy smoke, it's a finite resource. And sooner or later, it, uh, the price is going up. So, so first thing I did was come back to Hawaii and, and work with the legislators to pass a bill so that uh, farmers could get low interest loans for a renewable project. So we, we, I came back in October or so, and by the time the session was over in May, we had the bill drafted and signed by the governor. So what, how, how big a difference did uh, getting that bill in place make to your uh, energy usage and your ability to uh, make a profit? Uh, yeah, so it just so happened that we had a flume running through our property. It right. was an old plantation flume, maybe 100 years old. Yeah. And so you, as soon as I started to realize that, that uh, it was all about energy, I, I started to think about that flume. So when I came back, you know, we, we, first of all, we made the law, and second of all, we, we uh, applied for that loan, and we did get, get the loan, and so we developed a 100 AW uh, hydro project right. and, and generate our own electricity. Okay, that's great. So, um, so what did that do to the pluses and minuses? Did that kind of, you know, it didn't zero out all your bill, but how big an impact did it have on your ability to uh, farm? Well, you know, at that time, I think uh, the biggest bill we had was about thirteen or fourteen thousand a month, and uh, when we got the hydro operating, it dropped it down to two thousand a month. Wow, that's so huge! It made, a, it made a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, what's uh, so? Moving forward, I mean, why did you eventually have to close your farm? I mean, you know, so you, you managed to make the pluses better than the minuses for a while. So you're a farmer making money, so you're farming. And as you like to say, when farmers make money, farmers farm. But now you're not farming. So what happened? Was it just slowly, you know, raising prices or what, what was the uh, situation? Well, you know, back in uh, 2008, you know, when the oil price spiked to $247 a barrel, um, the price dropped soon after that. Right. And when the price dropped, not everything dropped. You know, the cost of fertilizer did, didn't go down as much as it, we probably, you know, we thought it should have, as well as the uh, plastics and everything. So the price didn't drop as much as we thought it should have. So, so that was one thing. But as time went on, it was more the effect of the bunchy tough virus. Uh, and it, it was located, we knew it was in Puna. And, and then we, we were watching it because uh, uh, we knew exactly what it looked like. And we, we would scout around in Hilo because generally what would happen is coming out of Puna, it would blow for the north. And so we, we drove the communities to see if uh, any, any plants were affected. Yeah. And then we, sooner, you know, we started finding plants getting closer and closer to the Wailuku River. And then one day it jumped across. 
And then it went further up. And then we was embedded in, in the culture. And once it was embedded in the culture, there's nothing we could do to, to stop it because it's spread by an aphid. Right. And so then we knew sooner or later it was, we were going to get it. So then the question that became, how much time do we have? What does the economic cycle look like? If we did close it down, what would happen to our workers? So at that particular time, the economy was still good. So, so uh, our workers could actually find other jobs. So we figured, okay, why don't we make that decision instead of make the decision when we're uh, when, when there were no jobs and the workers had no alternatives. Yeah. So that that's the reason we we got out of bananas. Okay. So and, and, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and tomatoes. We you know at at some point before we decided to close on the bananas, we uh, saw that uh, competition was coming, and we needed to diversify. So we looked at uh, what kind of crops we could grow, and we decided to do hydroponic tomatoes. And the reason for it was because of the, the cost characteristic. Bananas was uh, a crop that was uh, small margin, but large volume. So we decided we'd take, do something that had a small volume, but large margin. And that would be hydroponic uh, uh, specialty tomatoes, yeah? Right. So that's, that's, that's when we went into tomatoes. So we had both going. Then at some point, then we had the effect of the virus, which we had already seen what we can do with KL. So we knew what was what could happen. So so we got out of uh, bananas, but at the same time, tomatoes. You know, we were coming up at the twelve year mark, and we had financing for ten years, and we were fine up to ten years. But when the time came to we do the infrastructure, we did the numbers, and the numbers wouldn't come out. Right. So instead of spending the money, we decided to uh, close it. So how big a factor was energy in, the, uh, in your tomato farming operation? Uh, it, it was a big, big factor. But, but what is um, important to, to know is that energy is embedded in everything you do, in, in, in the building material, in, in the paint, in, in, in the driving, you know, vehicles around. Not, not, it's not only uh, what you expect to see on your financial report. It's embedded everywhere. So, so the, the cost of energy had gone up since uh, 2000, uh, 1970. It was $20 a barrel for the longest time. And it started to climb up and then it eventually reached 70. Um, and, and all that cost is embedded. So, so in other words, it was and is right now more difficult to be a farmer than it's been in the, in the uh, since at least 2008. Right. So talk to us about the shale situation because everybody views uh, shale gas as the savior of our uh, energy economy and we're now the world's largest producer and exporter of uh, fossil fuels. But you have a different angle on that. So what's your um, understanding of uh, how long is that going to last? Is that just like a bubble that's going to pop? Where are we? Yeah, uh, well, this is what happened. So 2007, we got uh, and went to the conferences. 2008 got really scared because uh, it was real clear at that time that the U.S. Uh, uh, oil supply was, was declining, you know. And, uh, but at the same time, 2009, 2000. And the shale oil uh, uh, started to increase in volume. And then uh, eventually it, 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 it made it look like there was no problem because uh, the U.S. started to increase its production of, of, of oil, which we didn't expect in 2008 and, uh, 2007, 2008 and in that area. But, but in 2009, what I was sitting at, at a, a, a conference and and this uh, shale uh, uh, geologist was explaining what he thought uh, things looked like. So he said, you know, take the Barnett Shale in Texas. Out of 4,000 wells, he said the, the, the average well only lasted uh, four years. And that was kind of a shock because if, if, if you know it lasts only four years, 
then uh, that means that every four years you got to drill another one just to stay even. Right. So I knew that back in 2009. Right, and I right. knew the guy that was saying it was credible because I've been following it. I, I, I know what he says, and I double-check, make sure he's right and all that. So, so first of all, you know that it doesn't last long. And it's also not very large, this shield well. Right. So, uh, Richard, uh, I, I want to interrupt you. We're, we, we're coming up to a break uh, for an advertisement, so we'll be right back. So hold that thought. Okay. Thank you. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. I'm live at five every Wednesday where we have entertaining and educational conversations that are real and relevant, both here in Hawaii and across the globe. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, well, we're back from the break. We're live on the uh, phone uh, from the Big Island. We have Richard Ha, uh, a farmer who uh, is well known to all of us here in uh, Hawaii, a heck of a guy. So uh, we we're talking about shale oil and how it may just be a flash in the pan. So Richard's going to continue on on that dialogue. So Richard, uh, carry on and <laughs> tell us more about shale oil. Okay, I, I was saying that uh the average well doesn't last very long, less than uh, four years, 90% comes out. And not only that, they're, they're small. So uh, to give you an idea, in the last 10 years, we drilled 70,000 of those wells. Wow, that's a lot. Most, most people don't have a clue that we did that. So, so if, we dub, if we need to double it, can you even imagine doing another 70,000 in the next 10 years? I, I don't know where we'd, we'd go look for it. But, but, you know, when you're looking at today, what, what's happening today, two months ago, uh, Schlumberger, the, the president of Schlumberger in an earnings call, said that 50% uh, of the wells in the Permian Basin, which is the biggest uh, shale play now, are child wells. And, and, you know, he explained what child wells were. And basically what it was is when you go and, and decide how to, how to uh, uh, drill the sweet spot. You, you just kind of figure out a diagram and decide how far to place it so they don't cannibalize each other, and you drill them all. Well, what, he, what he's saying is that now 50% of the wells are child wells, which means that they're drilling in between what they initially set out. Ah. So 50% of that is are child wells, and they can see that it's, it's not producing as much. Now, what happens after you drill all the child well? There's, to me, there's no room to go drill in between anymore. You know, but right. who, who am I? I'm a banana farmer. But I tell you what, it makes common sense to me. Everything I see is that's, that's what's going on. Well, it seems to me like farmers are the true entrepreneurs in our economy because uh, they take all these risks. You know, we've heard how you've had to analyze weekly your uh, profit and loss and uh, Look forward uh, several years up. I mean, when, when, is the, uh, when is the plague of aphids going to hit my farm? And you plan, plan for that, and you get ready for it to hit, and you, you're proactive um, and keeping uh, your head above water and taking care of your employees. I mean, wow, that's a huge deal. So, you know, what, what are the solutions then to this? I mean, it sounds like we're going down this, uh, this rocky road, and there's a big cliff waiting for us at the end is that is it going to be that severe or what's uh what do you think are solutions we should be taking right now you, you know in, I, and i once i went to those conferences i started to be uh, pay attention so i ended up going to iceland to look at uh their situation with uh, uh geothermal and hydro 
Right. Then I went to the Philippines to see how they drilled it, you know, and where, how they got their, uh, uh, themselves set up and stuff like that. We are so lucky in Hawaii on the big island to have geothermal because we're going to be over the hot spot for 500,000 to a million years. Wow. And that's, not, that's not me talking, you know, it's, it's the senior scientists over there talking. Yeah. yeah so, so kind of sustainable, it seems to me. I think so. So yet we have people, uh, I mean, it sounds like they're planning to have the geothermal wells, uh, 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 PGV up and running by the end of this year, um, you know, bureaucracy permitting, but, you know, in the press today, there's people that are still against it, which is hard to believe. What's your idea? What's your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I, I've been all over looking at geothermal from, from, uh, well, you know, take this for example, 70,000 wells, shale wells, and they all have SO2 and, and uh, hydrogen sulfide. It's, it's part of their operation. They are very, very uh, astute. They, they know exactly what they, they need to know. They're very experienced. Uh, I, I don't know if people actually realize that that's second nature for them to deal with this kind of stuff. And when I went to Iceland, you know, and, and we were passing the... the, the, the uh, fumes coming out of the, the steam coming out of the uh, uh, geothermal well. And I was describing to them how uh, uh, stringent our rules and regulations, the Department of Health rules are in, in Hawaii. The yep. scientists rolled their eyes because they, you know, it was like, wow, you guys are, anyway, you know. So I, I, I felt kind of good because I felt like Hawaii was taking care of their people. Yeah. Right. But, but yeah, so I, I feel like in general, it's, uh, uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, regulate the geothermal uh, uh, H2S and stuff like that from a nuisance level. The nuisance level is based on what you can smell. And the human nose is very, very uh, sensitive, yeah. you know, compared to uh, what the requirements are for OSHA. To, to to stop work. I mean, I mean, it's 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 incredible the differences. So I I feel like it's pretty safe. So getting back to my favorite topic, what do you think about hydrogen? How does hydrogen factor into our uh, energy system going forward in the future? Uh, many many people, myself included, think that it's the uh, it's uh, the big solution for our energy system going forward. What are yes. you share your thoughts? Yeah, okay, and uh, there's two ways you can make hydrogen, yeah? One is you reform the natural gas or whatever is cheapest at that time. Uh, that's one way of getting hydrogen, and natural gas is cheap, so get, making hydrogen is relatively inexpensive right. if you were to put it on the mainland. Uh, on the other hand, you can make it out of uh, electricity by sending electricity to water and the hydrogen bubbles up. Now, the thing about it is this, if the hydrogen, the, the source of electricity is, is a cheap source, now you're talking, and especially if it's geothermal, that that'll last for 500,000 years, because the heat is basically free. It won't go up in price. On the other hand, the fossil fuel is a finite resource. Wait long enough, it'll pass uh, uh, the cost of, of uh, geothermal sooner or later. So it's a safe bet to, to rely on hydrogen based on uh, geothermal plus, plus the other, the solar and wind and stuff like that. Yeah, I think the big, uh, my personal opinion is the big advantage of geothermal is, as you said earlier, it's uh, you know, steady state baseload power. And uh, you know, talking from the point of view of making the best use of your capital investment in the infrastructure to produce hydrogen, which is essentially an electrolyzer, it means that that electrolyzer is always working. Uh, and as opposed to, I mean, solar is a great resource too, and, but it's only good for five or six hours a day. And uh, even though you're, we're getting, we're hearing, you know, stories about solar getting down to around two cents to three cents a kilowatt hour, which is, makes it totally economic compared to fossil fuel. It's only there for five or six hours of the day. Whereas, you know, the old uh, geothermal plants like the Energizer Bunny, it's just, keeps going and going and going and going. So you make the best use of that big capital investment in these big uh, electrolyzers. And that's where we have to graduate to, is uh, yep. what, what they call hydrogen at scale. Right now, 
you know, I have a 65, kilo, uh, 65 kilogram per day electrolyzer at the Nelha site. And, uh, you know, it, it was pretty big at the time when we first purchased it, but now it's a tiny little thing compared to what we actually need. I mean, we need to be producing thousands of kilowatts, uh, kilograms of hydrogen to uh, at least convert over our transportation system. So, for example, I have a bus uh, that's almost ready to deploy to the Big Island. Um, it uh, uses 20 kilograms of hydrogen, gets about 200 mile range, and carries 29 passengers. Beautiful bus, and it's uh, you know taxpayer money, so the taxpayers are going to get a chance to use the bus and get the benefit of their tax dollars. So, do you have any comments about public transportation? No, I, I like the idea, and especially hydrogen, you know, you, you can climb hills and you can carry big loads with hydrogen compared to a uh, 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 battery. Power. So I, I, I really like hydrogen. Absolutely. Yeah, fuel cells have really advanced. Uh, you know, when I first started in the fuel cell business, it was really great if a fuel cell could go for 1,000 hours or even 500 hours. Now, we have buses in California, fuel cell buses. They've got over 30,000 hours on their fuel cell, and it's still going. I mean, it has a very slight degradation curve. This is slightly trending down, but they're probably good for many more thousands of hours. and so. When you look at that compared to an engine, a diesel engine, uh, it's starting to look much better than uh, a, a diesel engine or a diesel engine bus. And uh, regenerative braking, instead of uh, having to use the brakes, you use your electric motor as a generator, that slows the bus down, so you're recovering energy. And also you're saving wear and tear on your brakes. So a lot of really uh, big benefits there with uh, public transportation. The people in California love their hydrogen buses. They, They'll wait for that diesel bus to go away with all its diesel fumes and noise and wait for that nice, stealth, quiet, clean hydrogen bus to show up. And, uh, and that's the preferred uh, method of transportation. So we're getting down to towards the end of our show. Believe it or not, it's gone really fast. So I'm going to let you do some more talking. Uh, and uh, we, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about hydrogen if you think you'd uh, care to do that. Yeah, sure. You know, I, what I think uh, the possibility for, for uh, geothermal and consequently hydrogen uh, around the base of Mauna Kea, you know, uh, Professor Don Thomas was drilling for water and he ran into hot water. And he didn't have a permit to do hot water, but he's, he's you know, always interested to know uh, about geothermal. So he was watching the temperature rise as, as he was, the deeper he drilled. Right. And I, I, he's a good good friend of mine, so I, you know, I asked him, so Don, uh, so what are the limits? He said, boiling, boiling water is the, is outside of this uh, 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 permit. Right. But uh, so I told him, how, how, how much deeper would you have to drill to get to geothermal temperature? He said, I, by my guess, about a thousand more feet. And then my next question was, how much energy do you think is under uh, the slopes of Mauna Kea? He said, you know, Unofficially, I wouldn't be surprised if there were more. There was more energy underneath there than the entire East Rift. Wow! And I, I saw it in, in the Philippines because we were on a mountain that had last erupted a thousand, hundred thousand years ago. Mauna Kea last erupted four thousand years ago. Right. So there's a big potential over there. So, so you know, if if you could do geothermal on Hawaii homes land, you could take the electricity and bring water up, and you could turn that. Uh, higher level into orchards, you know, of apple right. peaches. And oh, there you never thought of that. Very good. Well, we've got to wrap it up. Uh, we're out of time, believe it or not, but I want to bring you back and we can carry on uh, this conversation, which was a great conversation and we'll even get you live next time. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you're live, but I mean, picture wise. So, so thank you very much. Uh, for uh, coming on the show, Richard. I really appreciate it and um, look forward to seeing you the next time over on the Big Island. Um, so everybody, that wraps up uh, Hawaii, the state of uh, clean energy for uh, this Wednesday. And before I know it, next Wednesday we'll be here and I have no idea who we're gonna have yet. So anybody out there wanna talk about energy, put your hand up, phone uh, or send an email to me or to Think Tech Hawaii. We'd love to have you on and hear your story. Okay, aloha everybody. Have a great Wednesday evening.